like to find a distinct honor and privilege to welcome all of you here to Atlanta, uh, particularly, especially to the Sam Nunn Building. I do want to make sure that I give special thanks to uh, my counterpart at GSA, Mr. Sham Reddy, who helped uh, make some of the, make this possible today. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, support and help from many of the other presidential appointees, including including. Uh, the newest member of our team who is with us today will be doing a session uh, a few minutes, so please uh, bear with me while I give special acknowledgement to Mrs. Ms. Pam Rochelle, who was just recently appointed uh, as the regional director of HHS. And so I mention that because uh, here in the region, one of the things that we've made the commitment to do is make sure that we talk about environmental justice holistically throughout the entire administration. It's not just something at EPA, uh, but it funnels throughout everything uh, that all of us do. Uh, it is an honor to bring you greetings on behalf of my boss, EPA Administrator Lisa P. Jackson. She sends her warm regards. I also want to make sure that I acknowledge my other uh, panel members, Dr. McLean. Uh, please give her a round of applause. And just to make sure I don't violate protocol, give Lisa a round of applause too. But going back to Dr. McLean, she's worked closely with many of our many people in our region, and for years, her uh, phenomenal work at Harambe House in Savannah, Georgia, where she's been able to create a safe haven for her community to come and learn about the steps to make her, their community cleaner and healthier for their families. Uh, we're also pleased to have uh, another tremendously engaged partner and good friend of mine, Ms. Nataki Osborne Jelks. Uh, she is an example of the next generation uh, of environmental advocates, and I've known Nataki, I won't tell you how long, um, but thrilled that uh, we've been able to kind of reconnect, our paths have reconnect, where we can continue to work on environmental justice. Uh, when you talk about achieving environmental justice, past, present, and future, you have to recognize that this week uh, is a symbol of, of a pivotal time in our communities. It demonstrates that all of us, both individually but especially collectively, have power in our words and in our actions. And when you stop and think about the entire unjust environmental justice movement, past, present, and thinking about where you go, where we're going to go in the future, you've got to take time and think. You know, it was about 30 years ago uh, that this movement started with a poor African American community in Warren County. North Carolina that was overrun by contamination in their soil. They were unable to enjoy just the basic inherent right of breathing clean air, enjoying clean water, and being able to play and enjoy clean land. And thus, they were not going to stand for it anymore and started what has now become the environmental justice movement. And so today, we make every effort to make sure that every community uh, is safe, is clean, and therefore able to thrive without the threat or uh, pressure of environmental degradation. As we look to the future, it's our hope that our past successes, whether it's uh, Regenesis in Spartanburg, South, uh, South Carolina, or other places around the country, uh, that they help shape the successes of our future, particularly for our children. Uh, I came to this position just about two years ago, as Denise said, uh, and immediately, or actually during the interview process, uh, Administrator Jackson was talking to me about her commitment to environmental justice, and I began shaping some ideas about what we can do here in the region. And when you think about Region 4, it's very unique. Obviously, we cover eight states. It's the largest region of any of my uh, nine other counterparts. It has the largest population. We also work very closely with fed six federally recognized tribes. But as you look at the geographical makeup of our region, we have some extreme pockets of poverty, not just in rural areas, but also in our urban areas. In all of our eight states, all of our eight states have a poverty level of at least 16.5%. All eight. Wow. On average, uh, it's 
for all Region 4 states. We also have an average of 47.6% of our children under the age of 18 live below the poverty level. Think about that for a minute. In this region, almost half of our children live in poverty. And so when you think about the future, one of the things that I stand here committed to do, and we all are committed to do, is make sure that that future for those children is as bright and as brilliant as possible. And making sure that it, they are free and able to thrive in an environment that's free from pollution. Now obviously to achieve that goal, it's something that we uh, are committed to doing together. Each and every person in this room has a part in fulfilling the future for those children. And what we've tried to do here in the region is reaffirm that commitment. I was blessed to have joined a staff that took environmental justice very seriously. Uh, and we continue to integrate environmental justice into all that we do and elevate the discussions about environmental justice. All of us have been committed to making sure that we approach the environmental justice concerns in this region from a multimedia, multi-program perspective. And really, we're hoping that that presents the best benefit to the citizens because they're not just then getting water experts for their issues or super fun experts uh, individually. They're getting the comprehensive pa package, again, with the thought of making sure that the children in these communities can continue to thrive. And so we've already started to see some success in several pockets of our uh, region, but we're looking forward uh, to even more success in the future. So whether as you talk about Regenesis, as I mentioned before, or our work in Jacksonville, Florida, where we concentrated our efforts in Hub Zone 1, uh, it was an area that had the highest rate of asthma and the highest number of houses testing positive for lead-based paint in the Duval County area. Again, we used, that was our uh, environmental justice pilot project. We use that to, again, hone our skills of working together and making sure that we were delivering success on the ground. We're proud to say that we've been able to help the community move towards the establishment of a much-needed health center, which is accessible to folks in the community. We've also delivered asthma risk training to over 1,000 preschoolers and their parents, again, to make sure that parents are empowered and educated about how best to make sure that their children are safe and healthy. We've also worked with many community members there to work on water quality and improve that for so many people. Now, Jacksonville is just one of the many areas. Obviously, there are cities throughout the entire region that we are working in and others that probably are still yet to be named. But please know that if you know of a community, let us know about it. We are here to make sure that we can provide whatever assistance, technical uh, or otherwise, to continue to make our communities thrive. So again, these are just some of the past examples. Uh, but with all of the work that we at EPA are doing, that we are trying to do with the federal family, that we are doing obviously with our members uh, and partners in the community, uh, we are going to be successful. I'm going to name it and claim it. You don't bring this many people together at right. one point in time Come on and now. not expect success <laughs> as a result. Right. Right. Amen to that. Amen to that. If you were going to craft a solution right. to environmental justice, you would do it with the people in this room. That's right. Mm -hmm. We had, and this was, I guess, on Monday, over 260 people pre-registered. And that's not including the folks that registered today. today. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about power, when you talk about a voice, mm -hmm. it comes from the people in this room. And the other interesting thing is it's not just community members that we have with us. This is a multidisciplinary mix of business, academia, faith communities, community members, stakeholders from across not only this region, this country, but also this world. We have several members from the international community with us, and we're very grateful to have them as partners as we continue the fight to achieve environmental justice. I do want to also make sure that I send a special thank you out to our uh, minority academic institutions. 
who we've signed about 25 or so memorandums of understanding since my tenure here as we continue to uh, place people in communities, to hear from communities, build on the relationships that they already have with their community members. And they were so gracious to serve as hubs, if you will, for the live streaming that we're doing. So not only are we taking the, the knowledge from the past, we're now using the technology of the future through virtual uh, meetings and gatherings to get the word out. We will be tweeting uh, and Facebooking things that happen today. And that's how movements take hold. Maybe one person, one voice, one tweet. But you don't know the power right. that that can have. Exactly. If you think about it as a ripple in a pond or a drop in a pond and the ripples that occur from that one drop exactly. can reach shores and communities and lives that we never imagined. Imagine. Right. Also speaking about some of the um, younger people that we have with us, we have some special uh, posters that are going to be on display from our young environmentalists, that next generation as we look to the future. And I'll tell you y'all, they get it already. <laughs> They just need us as partners so that we can help prepare them to receive the torch so that this movement continues going forward. One of, in closing, one of my favorite quotes is one by Margaret Mead. It says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever happens. So with the people in this room, let's change the world. Thank you, Glenn. Our next speaker is going to be Nataki Osmond-Jones. We can't stop and give up on them. Because they are right. That shine on, inspire us to climb on from all of the places we've been. And we've been incredibly blessed to be able to draw inspiration and direction from our sister and brother warriors who have taken on toxic giants and barriers of race, class, and sometimes gender to change our realities and to restore improved health and quality of life to our communities. They are sources of strength and inspiration that propel us young folks and us community folks to challenge seemingly unbeatable political and economic forces and harness enough power to triumphantly, um, to, to, to triumph victoriously against great odds. And in acknowledging their contributions to our foundation, I pause to just give them their flowers and recognition and well-deserved honor while they are still here. Then there are some others who have already gone on from here, but we can't lift them up enough. In doing so, we recall their struggles. We celebrate their victories. And we are encouraged by their examples. And the push to move on with urgency is reignited within us. As we celebrate these leaders, we must acknowledge our women. Sometimes we didn't even know their names, but they have always been there. And many times, as Dr. McLean has reminded us, that as some of us go to conferences and bear witness to our struggles in public forums, there are those who are at home keeping watch and they do so even while we are here. Yes. And so when some major milestones have been achieved and reached within the environmental justice movement, women have led those fights. They've played every role possible from the front lines to the way behind the scenes, never get any recognition positions. They have shared their struggles in town hall meetings and public hearings and shareholder meetings and, and on statewide, regional, national, and even international stages. So this morning, as we reflect on where we've been and where we are going, we speak their names. The names of our leaders whose sweat, work, and fortitude have brought us to the middle of this mountain. Our mother, Hazel Johnson, from the south side of Chicago, Illinois. Dan Austin, from South Central Los Angeles. Deborah Matthews and Dr. Grace Huell from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Leola McCoy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Margaret Williams, Pensacola, Florida. Laversia Wiggins, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia. 
Bernice Miller Travis, Katie yeah. Shepard, yeah. Elizabeth yeah. Young here. Awesome. Melba West, Margie Bouchard, Evangelist Charlotte Keys, yeah. Faye Bush, Dr. Florence Robinson, Juanita Stewart, Dr. Mildred McLean, yeah. Connie yeah. And our brothers, Tom Goldtooth, Richard Moore, Cheryl Marcus, Reverend Richard Bright, yeah. Arthur Smith, Marvin Crafter, Reverend Zach Lai. Mm, yes. I can go on and on and on, but I won't because the list yes. would take a, would just take Good. too long. Yes. But as we talk about each a past, present, and future, we have to lift up those names. And there are also some other important things that we have to remember. As our movement moves forward, we have to remain vigilant on some of the age-old problems that still remain. When I think about my community in Northwest Atlanta and the Proctor Creek watershed, uh, we, we are still suffering from pollution from Atlanta's combined sewer overflow system, a remnant of the late 1800s. Wow. This legacy of injustice started when sanitation in Atlanta was limited to the downtown business districts and, uh, and adjacent upper class white communities. And those struggles continue today as low income and communities of color now have access to the sewer infrastructure, but neighborhoods like Vine City and English Avenue, who, who are in the, in the shadows of the Georgia Dome and the Georgia World Congress Center, parts of the major economic engines of Atlanta, these neighborhoods experience frequent flooding with waters laced with fecal matter from, from raw untreated sewage and other pollutants. And just recently, we found that neighborhoods like the Pittsburgh community close to Turner Field, uh, home of the Atlanta Braves, are experiencing some of those same things. So we've got to stay committed to some of those old problems that still exist. But as my Congressman John Lewis said, I believe that in the coming days and months, the cause of civil rights will become more about protecting green spaces and open land, about clean air, clean water, and clean land. Mm -hmm. It's about our fundamental right to pursue a healthy life, physically, mentally, and psychologically. It's about whole communities, not just communities free of pollution and toxics, but communities that also have an equitable share of positive amenities, of parks, of green spaces, access to fresh fruits and vegetables, healthy community design, communities that are designed in ways in which the built environment promotes healthy behaviors and doesn't prevent those. Right. We also have to embrace new solutions. What started as a student-run effort at Morehouse College, retrofit a million, now levels the playing field for households of modest means by connecting them with free water and energy efficiency products that are installed by college students and volunteers. And I believe there's some folks from, Let's, uh, from retrofit a million here. They, in their efforts, have reduced millions of, car millions of tons of carbon pollution that would ultimately impact EJ communities while also reducing the out-of-pocket costs for households uh, in terms of what they pay for water and energy services. So we've got to embrace these leaders of the new school as well. And we've got to support them, people like Mia Robinson and Carrie Fulton, Omar Freya, Alyssa Combs, who is a student at Georgia State University, Tony Anderson, Imran Batla, and students like those who are here today, Janine McCoy from Spelman College, Kayla Buchanan from Mercer University, We've got to support these young people and we've got to nurture their interests and keep them engaged in this work. And I know my time is, is nearing a close, so as I prepare to sit down, I also want um, just to bring our attention back to the 17 principles of environmental justice. They were crafted in 1991, over 20 years ago, but they are still important today. And I'd like to focus in on number seven, it says that environmental justice demands the right to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making, including needs assessment, planning, implementation, enforcement, and evaluation. For all of our partners, whether they be from industry or government, um, from nonprofit organizations, as you respond to the challenges brought to you by communities, it's important to remember that the, if the community brought the problem to you in the spirit of collaborative problem solving, the community intends to be a part of that solution. Thank you. Oh. And you should resist working in silos right. without the community, even right. if your intent is to yes. be responsible. There are new, or I guess I should say old models with new names. 
things like community-based participatory research that has now been embraced by some of our federal government partners. Money has been invested um, to make CBPR happen. But before there was all of this praise about community-based participatory research, there were things like Affinet, developed by people like Dr. Dr. Mildred McLean, that brought together academic institutions, communities, and agencies. And so we've got to continue to sharpen those tools right. because collaboration is going to be the key to our success Absolutely. as we move forward. The way we can get some. That's Thank right. You. Thank you. Well done. Now, working on environmental justice, I was very young when I started. <laughs> very, very young. <laughs> and I'm so blessed. And I'm blessed because I've had the opportunity to work with people who are committed to changing what's happening inside of their communities. And that's a blessing because many of us get up, we go to work, and we go to a job. And it's, that's what it is, it's just a job. Mm -hmm. We get paid, we put our 40 hours in, and we go home. But when you work on environmental justice, you don't have that opportunity because we're dealing with people's lives. Whether we're in NGOs, we're in academia, we're in local government, state government, or federal government, the things that we do matter. They matter if we do them correctly, and they also matter if we do them incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And I think we should all sort of marinate on that for a second. <laughs> One of my mentors, Donald Smith, every time he would see me, and his spirit is here with us today, when we would finish talking, he would always say, keep the faith. But he said also, don't just keep the faith, but make sure there's action with that faith. Mm -hmm. So as I was hearing some of the other speakers this morning, I was thinking about some of the things that have happened that required faith, but also required action. One of the things was the women's suffrage movement. And for the longest time, women didn't have the right to vote. And some folks were okay with that. Well, why would you need to vote? We got you. Don't worry about it. We'll make sure that you're well taken care of. How many ladies are comfortable with other folks making decisions for them? <laughs> I didn't see too many hands go up in the I've also been very blessed to actually work with some of the civil rights leaders. And, and I think, and sometimes I look in their eyes, those that are still here with us. And I often look at the films that sometimes, some of us who are a little bit younger, who didn't live through that, and some of the things that they had to go through. And it amazes me that they still have that sparkle in their eyes for change. They had faith that things were going to get better. But they also had persistence, and they put action to that faith. And you know, we talk about Warren County, North Carolina, and how folks laid down to stop those trucks from moving through. They had faith that one, the trucks wouldn't run over, but two, that things were going to change. And I look at those lessons from the past, and they can be moved from those years ago to not that long ago into Miniman Square, where you had a young man who used a similar tactic to stand in front of those tanks. Absolutely. He had faith right. that yes. things were going to change, change, that things would get better. Right. He knew it may not necessarily happen with him, mm -hmm. but he knew that it would actually happen. happen. Mm -hmm. So I think about it, and the talk, he talked about some of our, our heroes and sheroes, and we have one who's right here beside us who, over the years, I've learned from, and Dana Alston, she also mentioned, and the, and the power in Dana, even though she was taken from us when she was very, very young. But it's about what you do while you're here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I look around the room, I know many of the people who are here in the room, and I know your dedication to this issue, mm -hmm. dedication to change. I think Dana passed away when she was about 45. But the impact that she made while she was here right. was immeasurable. Right. She knew that this issue probably wouldn't get resolved in her lifetime, but she was still willing to make that sacrifice. And that's what this is all about. It's about sacrifice. Many people often say environmental justice is not a sprint. It is a marathon. Mm -hmm. There are folks in this room who have been working on these issues 20, 30, or 40, 40 years, years right. in some instances. Right. But we know that change is coming. And we've heard people talk about some of the really positive things that have gone on so far. 
<laughs> you know, for those of us who were at that first People of Color Summit in 1991, you had to have faith when you brought that many people together and you started to draft out and develop a vision and a cohesive sort of strategy for addressing these issues. Because there were numbers of things going on, and as I talked to more and more people, they used to say, well, wow, I didn't know this was going on on this side of the country just like it was going on that side of the country. And that's the power of a movement. A movement demands faith. Right. It demands hope. Right. It demands action. Right. Ten years later, we had the next People of Color Summit. People came together. There are more tools in place. The vision has become stronger. It's become more cohesive. Individuals are now talking and making substantive types of changes. And some other things are starting to happen. Now, actually, the federal government is paying much more attention. There are new products that are in place. There are grant programs that have now started to have some success. The Environmental Justice Small Grants Program um, had some, some, some length behind it at that time. People were also sharing other things that needed to happen. The, the development of the CARE grant process. Some pollution prevention grants have now been put in place. A number of things have happened to help us to start to move forward. And I'm trying my best not to take away from the next speaker on some of the things that I know that she's going to talk about that are very impressive. And the changes are here. But we still have to push. And that's one of the things I hope that I can leave with folks is that we have to push. There are those who still don't believe that environmental justice is a reality. That's right. Even though asthma that's rates right. in some communities are still way, way too high. I'm on right, that. Right, we still have right, yeah. levels. And we have children who are having difficulty learning right. because Love some man. of the light right. issues are still not addressed. We're right. making progress, but we're still not there. Yeah. And yeah. you wonder why some of our children have uh, lower IQ scores. Mm, that's right. Why some of them are having difficulty in locating employment. Mm -hmm. Well, if you address these issues, then we take that out of the equation. Equation, exactly. There's still so much that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. 